a good friend. He was at the convention where my light went on in 2003 when I realized that I was not a libertarian anymore based upon some of the things that this gentleman and others had shared. It was in Phoenix, Arizona. On my birthday, ironically, October 19, 1980, uh, 2003, 19, 2003, my 65th birthday, somebody said to me, what's the difference between an anarchist and a libertarian? And I was nice enough because I'm not a nerd. I didn't jump in with my definitions. I uh, said, oh, what is it? And he says, six or seven years if you're paying attention. <laughs> and I said, well, it took me 20 years. So it was at that day on my birthday in 2003 that the light went on. Butler was at that convention in Phoenix. It was Summit 3. And Butler Schaefer has taught at Southwestern Law School for many years. And I was quite intrigued as a former law student and lawyer to find a person who had an, a mind or a, a, a skill set that had to do with individuality as opposed to collectivism. And he wrote a book that I came across and I said, Butler Schaefer, wow, this guy is really cool. They said, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's controversial. Well, being the controversial guy I am, I said, I one day have to meet him and, and we, we were able to do that. Butler is obviously of the judicial jurisprudence, juris doctor, or oh, I forgot what they used to, LLB type degree. And as a professor at Southwestern Law School, he has had the opportunity to influence the mind of many thinking lawyers who came out. Any questions? Oh, no, never mind. One of my, one of my fans, I can see that. The... I think I can kind of summarize this whole notion of liberty and the importance of private ownership of property in one sentence, and that is that liberty and private ownership of property are synonymous terms. And they, it's not that when you are, when you enjoy a condition of liberty, well, property is one of the things that we would pay attention to. It, it, it's at the very core of it. Um, the, uh, what, you know, whether our political thinking comes from uh, the political left uh, or the political right, and I think a lot of us have come from different uh, positions there, uh, the connection between liberty and private property has been very well stated by the late Trotskyite Max Eastman who said, quote, it seems obvious to me now, though I was slow coming to the conclusion, that the institution of private property, the dispersion of power and importance that goes with it, has been a main factor in producing that limited amount of free and equalness which Marx hoped to render infinite by abolishing this institution. Um, that, that just really gets to the essence of it. Because every political system is defined in terms of the form in which it opposes private ownership of property. Political systems and private property are not consistent. Get that out of your heads if you still, still think that there's some way to uh, reform the system. You know, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Frank Shodorov, used to say, said that that kind of thinking involves wanting to clean up the whorehouse but keep the business intact. Uh, <clears throat> but, a, but a system of communism political system of communism is premised on the idea that uh, the state will own substantially all of the uh, property within it, or at least the productive uh, property. Uh, milder forms of state socialism differ in terms of the kinds of property that they want to uh, control, you know, factories and railroads and so forth, but maybe not uh, individual stores. Uh, welfare state is a way in which a government uh, takes private property, i.e. money, from some people and bestows it upon others. Fascism is a system in which title to property remains in private hands, but control is exercised by the state. 
Um, so I'll leave it to you to figure out which kind of system that, that, that we have. Uh, title being privately owned, but control being exercised by the state. Anarchy, by contrast, is a, being a stateless system is a system in which property is owned and controlled by either individuals or voluntary uh, associations. The essence of ownership is control. He who um, makes decisions, who is in a position to exercise decision-making control over something, whether it's a person, whether it's those extensions of our person that we require in order to live well, food that we eat, land that we occupy, and so forth. Uh, we can identify who the owner is by asking who it is that can make the decision. Who is it that can make the ultimate decision with regard to an item of property? And that ultimate decision would include uh, the power to destroy the property. And uh, this is one of the reasons that the state and churches and all other institutional interests, because it's basically it's, it's the institutionalization of our organizations that's a problem, it's not just the state. Uh, you can see that going on right now. The role or the extent to which uh, the state and major corporations have this symbiotic relationship. It's one and the same, the corporate state. Um, no, none of these institutions want to acknowledge the right of some individual to, hi, to, uh, <laughs> uh, to commit suicide. Why? That would be a recognition that the individual has the ultimate decision-making power to be able to, to destroy yourself, to be able to destroy something that you own. Um, is an attack upon the idea of collective ownership. And so this is where the, this is where the battle always comes down to. There's a, a lot of discussion in the program that I had received and people were putting on the program about sovereignty. And I went to an etymological dictionary. Those are always fun to look at. And the word sovereign derives from the word super, which in turn derives from <coughs> notions of over and above. Over and above what? What is it that a sovereign exercises control over? Well, things in the world. What kinds of things? Well, people for one thing. Land for another. All kinds of resources, minerals, the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and so forth. Um, so the question, as I said before, always comes down to the philosophic question. You know, who gets to make decisions about what? That's, that's really where the inquiry has to begin. If you, are, if you enjoy a condition of liberty, then that's a, a condition in which humans live together in society respecting one, the inviolability of one another's property boundaries, including uh, over themselves. Um, the state itself is in, a, is in constant war with this notion of inviolability. It does not respect the inviolability of your property boundaries or mine. And the reason for that is if you <clears throat> take a look at how the state functions, how the state is even defined. You ask any political scientist uh, for a definition of the state, <clears throat> and it always comes down to this. It's an entity that enjoys a monopoly on the use of violence within a given area. Against what is the violence directed, if not individuals, and those extensions of the individual we call property. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the 
examples I try and get into with uh, some of my students in, in explaining all of this uh, has to do with this notion that, well, property rights aren't absolute. Sorry, kids, all property rights are absolute. By definition, somebody is going to be making decisions over items that are subject to ownership. Even in a communist system, property rights are absolute. Socialist system, fascist system, anarchistic system, whatever it is, property <coughs> rights are absolute. Someone has to have the final authority, the final sovereign power, if you want to put it in those terms, to be the one to make the decision as to whether or not we're going to do this or do that. One of the examples I've used is imagining that I have a brick in my hand. And my position on property is that as an owner, I am free to do with whatever it is I want to do with what I own. It's a position I've long adhered to. If I own something, then I am free to do whatever I want with what I own. And I usually get you know, some kind of qualifications on that from people. Well, what you mean is as long as you don't do this, you don't, no. Nope. No as long as, no provided, no on the condition that, none of that. If I own something I can do <clears throat> with, without any restriction whatsoever, anything I want to do with what I own. Now I've got this lovely brick. This will look like a nice plate glass window. Right? And so <clears throat> Richard here has this plate glass window. And I've got my brick. So I ask the question, consistent with the principle I've enunciated, am I entitled to throw my brick through his plate glass window? You get a lot of, and I, I, it's, what's nice is about the third or fourth student who answers gets it. Wait a minute, you said you can do whatever you want with your property. That's not your property. Oh, yeah. Meaning what? <clears throat> Meaning that my absolute authority to do whatever I want with what I own ends at the boundary lines of what I own. And if I want, if I want to throw my brick through Richard's Plate glass window, what do I do? If I'm the state, you know, I'll just send the SWAT team in, we'll break the windows and maybe Richard's head and anything else that happens to get in the way and exercise the decision making that we do premised upon violence. That's, that's all the state understands is violence. Among free men and women, what do I do? Am I prohibited from throwing my brick through the, through the window? If I really want to throw my brick through the window, what do I do? I enter into a contract. Richard and I contract. And he says, well, okay, if you're really interested in tossing a brick through my window, it's going to cost you whatever, $2,000, let's say. And I think about it and say, well... I don't know if I enjoy doing it for $2,000 worth, but how about $1,500? You think, well, how much is it going to cost me to replace the window and all of this? And so we agree upon a price, $1,500. And then I throw the brick through the window. <clears throat> Has any wrong been committed? Have I violated any rights of his? Have I, have I damaged any property interest of his? No. Because his property interest has now been redefined by our contract as including my right to throw the brick through it. So our notions of what it is we own are sort of in a constant state of flux, aren't they? Clear, but, but in, in flux. So that if, I, if, if you and I enter into a contract, then the, the 18th century English uh, jurist, uh, William Blackstone, <clears throat> once defined a contract as an agreement by two or more persons to exchange claims to the ownership of property. Any contract you enter into is, involves an agreement 
to exchange claims to ownership. Yeah, I will, I will sell to you the right to fill a brick through your window. In exchange for which, I agree to give up a property interest I have in $1,500. This is the way we get a loan. Well, <clears throat> what is interesting is, and I, I get into it in my, the first few pages of my Boundaries of Order book, just about every social issue, every social conflict, every social problem you can, you can think of. And this one goes for, <laughs> in my book, I don't know, a hundred or more uh, social questions. The kinds of issues we see presented in the news and so forth all the time. These are all property questions. Every one of them is a property question. From abortion to zoning and everything in between. They're all questions about who gets to make decisions about, about property. Um, but of course the state can't really tolerate this because if we start thinking of these questions as property questions, hmm, we might start expanding our inquiry into all kinds of areas the state would just as soon not have us think about. So it redefines these questions. The abortion question, for, for example, becomes a women's rights issue. What does that mean? Women have a different category of rights than do men? Explain that one to me. Well, they don't even <laughs> discuss that. But it's a property question. Is the unborn child a self-owning person? Or is the unborn child an extension of the property boundaries of the woman. Guess what? It's the same question, the same issues that arose with slavery. Same question. Was Dred Scott a self-owning person or was he the property of his master? We keep coming up with it. We do it with children. Are children self-owning people or are they the property of their parents or the state? State and parents get into this conflict as to which one gets the right of control. Pollution, well, that's another fun one, is a question that is premised on, well, being some, a, a wrong committed against some kind of concept known as the environment. What is the environment? I think the best definition I ever heard for the environment was anything that's not me. I like, I like that one. <clears throat> but from a property point of view, somebody who uh, spews smoke and all this stuff into the atmosphere, who dumps toxic waste out onto the land that gets absorbed into uh, underground water systems, or dumps it into a river or whatever, is committing a trespass. You know, the same as if you know, I take all my garbage and I don't, you know, the garbage collectors don't collect it, so I take it and throw it onto my neighbor's lawn. Is that a garbage disposal problem or a trespass? It's a trespass. But we can't have people thinking, thinking in those terms. <clears throat> The byproducts of people engaging in those types of, of polluting activities are to get into the body, the lungs, the, the, the stomach, the land, whatever it is of somebody else. The people who do that are not confining their decision making to the boundaries of what they own. And appropriate, appropriate designation is from, from the standpoint of economists. Economists refer to this as what? Socializing the costs, a form of socialism. Um, it's also referred to as externalities. External to what? What is the polluter externalizing? He's externalizing his decision making over things he doesn't own, over his neighbor. Crime, there's another interesting one. Crime is defined 
in terms of whether or not we are dealing with victimizing or victimless crimes. Well, the state kind of tolerates our talking about that as long as we don't get too carried away with it. But a victimizing crime, the state defines as what? This is a crime against society. No, it isn't. Murder, rape, arson, burglary, theft, whatever you want to call it. It's not a crime against society. It's a crime against some individual. It's a crime against a murder victim, a rape victim, a homeowner whose who's home was burned or something. Oh, we can't talk about that. Victimless crime, by definition, does not involve a property trespass. Gambling, drug use, prostitution, whatever it may be. There's no victim. There is no victim of a property violation, which ought to be, you know, at some point you'd think that <clears throat> maybe even the people on CNN would catch on to that. Uh, I don't hold my breath that that will occur. Immigration. The immigration, oh, that's a hot issue. Yeah, let's deal with the immigration. Part. It's, it's premised on the idea that the state is entitled to control who can and who cannot move about the earth. What portions of the earth? Does the state own the country? Does the United States own the whole country? You know, this, this is the old model, you know, the, the, the explorers would come over from Europe and find some, stick a flag in the ground and say, I declare this to be the property of the king of Spain or Portugal or England or France or whatever. Is that sufficient? Should we, should we respect a claim of ownership to someone who does that? What about going to the moon? I'm told, I don't know if this is true, I, I tried checking it out, I haven't found it, but <clears throat> I'm told that the astronauts when they went when they, go out, when they enter into their relationship with NASA, sign an agreement that they will not lay claim to the ownership of anything they find in space. Interesting. Interesting. Otherwise, they could otherwise. Why not? Hey, there's a nice little crater, you know, something I'll leave to my kids someday. That, you know, it has specific boundaries to it. And so I go over and lay claim to it. Why not? Um, so why, why, would, why would the state be considered the owner of the entire country? Is it just based upon the size of the state, the power that it exercises? <clears throat> if so, why not uh, allow such ownership claims to be advanced by others? Maybe major corporations. How about U.S. Steel or General Motors? I'm sorry, government motors, no, I guess they call it. Uh, being able to lay claim to anything in America. If size alone is what, is what matters. They apparently seem to do this in the area of foreign policy. You know, we want to control foreign policy in order to advance our economic interests in other countries. Children. Children's rights is the euphemism by which the state exercises control over children. Instead of asking the question, do children have property interests? Now, very small children, it's very hard to imagine them having a sufficient degree of sophistication, sophistication if you will, through which they could exercise an intelligent decision making about all kinds of matters. So we say, well, maybe, maybe the parents own the kids. Do you own your kids? Anyone own their kids? I ask my students this. And, Oh, no, I don't know. Okay, that's fine. That's good to know. Uh, I'm going to swing by your house about 4 o'clock this afternoon and pick them up because I need someone to take care of the lawn. So forth. Since you don't own them, what complaint do you have? Oh, well, yeah, well, I, I guess maybe I do own my kids. Can you kill them? Can you destroy them? If it's your property, you know, if I, if I own a building or something like that, the test of ownership is who can destroy who can destroy the item of property without asking someone else's permission. If you, have to, if you have to ask someone else's permission, the person you have to ask is the owner. <clears throat> Which is why people who would like to commit suicide, you know, people who are, let's say, 
uh, in, in suffering from some terminal illness or something of that, say, of that nature. And he said, you know, I just want to do myself in. I want to doc get a Dr. Kevork in to help me do myself in. No, no, you can't do that. You've got to go to court and get a judge to say that it's all right for you to do yourself in. Meaning, the judge owns you. Or at least the legal system that the judge represents owns you. Well, what about children? What is do you have a property relationship with your children? I like to think of it as being having a right, having a property interest in a relationship with the child, not that I own the child. You see the difference? We, we do have property, property interests in relationships, don't we? Business partners have a property interest in a relationship with each other. They don't own each other. One partner can't go out and, well, legally they can't go out and kill the other partner but they do have a recognized property interest there. Slavery, touched upon that earlier. Is it distinguishable from taxation or conscription? Did the 13th Amendment to the Constitution end slavery or only nationalize it? Only the government can own slaves, not private persons. Organ selling. I'm not talking about the things that crank out music. I'm <clears throat> if you enjoy self-ownership, can you sell your body parts? Kidneys, liver, whatever, uh, to other people? Uh, some of them you could do while you're still living. Uh, what about upon your death? And you say, I want, I want my uh, various organs to be people being sold by the executor of my estate to generate a lot of income to distribute to my beneficiaries. Oh, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. The government won't, won't allow that. The government's saying, in essence, we own you. Well, the... <clears throat> To get into the, and I'm just going to do this briefly because I'm running short on time. <clears throat> uh, the elements of property that we need to understand in order to analyze it have been well stated by uh, uh, Robert Lefay, with whom I worked and taught many, many, many years ago. So these elements are what are called boundary, claim, and control. And when we're talking about boundary, we're talking about identifying the essence of what it is that's subject ownership. Chattel, personal property, is, is a, has a self-contained self boundary. We don't have to wonder where it, where it ends. It's, it's defined by itself. This, this glass of water you know, is, has a self-contained boundary. Um, <clears throat> real estate eh, really doesn't. You go out onto some unknown parcel of land and say, you know, I want to, I'm hereby laying claim to all of this. You know, it's a great outdoors. Again, it's, <clears throat> it's an extension of the, the King of England putting the, the flag in the ground, or one of his agents doing it. Well, how far does that go? In Virginia, it was <laughs> early on, before they even found out where Virginia was geographically, uh, the Virginia government said, no, our, our property claim extends all the way to along this, this particular boundary, southern boundary and the northern boundary this way, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Meaning, <clears throat> you know, probably a good three-fourths of the United States. Well, did they control it? Should, they, should that claim be respected? If you can't control something, should the claim be respected? I, this is one of the questions I get into with my students. On, I go back to the moon example. Um, what would keep me, I, as far as I know, no one else down here on Earth has made any kind of a documented claim to the ownership of the moon. Suppose I do. So they say, hey, this is, this is great. Uh, I hereby lay claim to the ownership of the moon. Does it have a boundary? Yeah, it's a self-contained boundary, isn't it? Okay, got that. Have I asserted a claim? Yeah. It's mine. I publish this claim in all the major newspapers around the world. All of you keep off. NASA, get your, if 
feet off my property. Should that claim be respected? Well, one of the problems you get into with uh, making property claims of this sort goes to, as I said before, the essence of ownership is control. Can I exercise effective decision-making control over what I've claimed ownership of, namely the moon? I might be able to if I got up there, which is, I think is why NASA requires their astronauts to, to by contract, say we won't do that. But suppose there's a little crater up there. Suppose I get up there and I find this small crater and say, well, that's good for starters. I hereby lay claim to it. <clears throat> I put a fence around it, perhaps. I put a stake on the ground that says this crater uh, belongs to Schaefer. And then I come back to Earth. Should my claim be, re be respected? Why not? Why not? It's just another form of absentee ownership. I may come back, I may not, but in the meantime, at the time I asserted my claim of ownership over a specifically bound piece of property, I exercised control over it. So these are the, the kinds of questions that I think we need to uh, explore. Uh, and as I said before, it all begins with a question of self-ownership. Do you own yourself? And do you know what that means? Do you really understand what it means to say, to assert self-ownership? This is one of the reasons I long ago gave up participating in politics. My first job after I graduated from law school was a political job. I was very active in the Goldwater movement and got elected as part of our state's delegation to that convention and so forth. All of which kind of helped get me over the top and understand there's, there's no way you're gonna resolve these problems through politics. It's just not, it just, you know, you, you have to become what it is you're opposing to do it. And so I rely upon the self-ownership aspect of all of this and say that you really, really want to become a sovereign, free individual, you have to start exercising control by simply withdrawing your energies from it, not by trying to take it over. So anyway, any questions or are we out of time on that? I have never been a fan of copyrights or patents. Uh, being a good anarchist, I recognize that if you're going to have copyright or patent protection, it's going to have to come, it's probably going to have to come through a state. I don't believe in a state, in the existence of it. So the question would be, in a free society, in a, in a, in a society based on liberty, would people uh, acknowledge this kind of, of, of right to one another? I've got uh, three books out there, actually four if you include a, one of the e-books that I have on lourockwell.com. Um, <clears throat> I have copyrighted this just for my own protection, but anyone who wants a copy of this can just go online and get it. I don't get, I don't get any royalties from any of this stuff. And if anyone here wants to <clears throat> take any of my books and just reproduce the hell out of them, please do so. I love it. You know. <laughs> And if you have any trouble finding it, I'll help you find it. I would love, I would love to have, you know, 200 million people sitting around the campfire reading that instead of, you know, doing some of the other things they're doing. So be my guest, really. Uh, anyway, I don't know. That's yes, sir. Water does property start with the watershed? Well. That's, water, is, as far as it's kind of an interesting idea. If you, if you own a piece of property that a river runs through and you say, well, I own the, the river. Well, by the time you got through saying that, the part of the river that you own is now downstream, isn't it? Uh, is it possible for people to own uh, bodies of water, lakes and so forth? Sure, why not? There's anything else? The, the question is, if, it's, if you're dealing with unowned property, like a river or lake or the ocean or whatever it is, and someone else is 
taking the byproducts of what it is they're doing, the entropy that comes out of their activity, and saying, well, I don't want this. It's of no value. Entropy is energy that's otherwise unavailable for productive use. I don't want it. I'm going to dump it someplace. And if I dump it onto either someone else's land, or dump it into the air, or dump it into a river, or onto the ground where it gets into the water supply, where does it go? It goes onto someone else's property, doesn't it? Or it gets breathed in by someone else. Or um, someone goes, goes uh, swimming in the river. And now when they come out, uh, their skin is bright orange. Um, have I committed a trespass if I do that? Yeah, why not? If I said, do I have a right to set fire to my house? <clears throat> well, if I own the house, it may be that it may be there's some other people who have a property interest in the house, a, a bank with a loan and, and so forth. But if I own it outright, should, am I entitled to <clears throat> just burn the house down if I want to? Yeah, why not? But suppose that fire expands over into my neighbor's property, burns his house down. I've committed a trespass. So. Anywho. Yes, sir. Uh, if somebody's naked in his front yard and visible to others, and they're deeply offended, is... Uh... Well, it, it, would depend, it would depend on who it is that's naked in their front yard. I... Oh, they may be very much offended, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I may take offense at a lot of things people do. Uh, the question is, have they committed a trespass against me? Uh, am I entitled to stand out in my front yard naked uh, and maybe even without being laughed at uh, <clears throat> if, my neighbors, if my neighbors object? Should my neighbors be entitled to prevent me from doing so? I have, when, you, when you come up with that example, I'm reminded of, of some guy who, who, the true story, at least it was reported in the news is true. I hope it must be true. Um, <clears throat> some guy was in the habit of standing in front of his big picture window, stark naked, and women walk by, do all this sort of stuff. And some of the neighbors thought, well, you know, calling the police and all that sort of stuff is going to be a problem. So what they did was go over at night and paint his window black. Oh, you know, sometimes you can come up with Was that a trespass? Sure it was. But, you know, we're so, I'm not sure who's first. Um, now, I'm wondering that your focus seems to be on negative externalities. Uh, I'm wondering about positive externalities, like someone who landscapes a, a place of property and raises the value of your property. Yeah, yeah. All, all, all the software <coughs> I don't regard uh, externalities as a problem because it reduces the value of your property. The market does that. There has to be, there has to, be a, a, to me, it has to be some kind of a physical trespass. So that if I'm putting something onto your property, whether it increases the value or decreases the value of it, uh, to me is not, is not relevant. That's a question of, is there a trespass? Um, the the is not harmful, you consider it a yeah, well, we, we get into this whole area, of the, the legal dis distinction between nuisance and trespass. You know, a nuisance doesn't have to be a trespass. Many, many times it is. But if my neighbor uh, paints his house chartreuse and fuchsia and, and is built out of rubber tires and things like that, and I say, oh, God, that's ugly, so forth. Has he committed a trespass against me? No, I don't see, I don't see one. Um, could I go into court and have a court? Uh, enjoin his use of the property on the grounds that it's a nuisance, it's lowered property values. Sure, courts don't respect property boundaries. Now, the, the flip side of that, and I always ask my students this question, if I can recover for the economic loss that it, it caused not by the neighbor, but by other, other people in the society devaluing uh, his property because of that, and maybe devaluing, devaluing mine. Suppose it's increasing it. 
Suppose my neighbor puts up a beautiful mansion. Suppose my neighbor is some celebrity, really a great, wonderful celebrity, or, or a very rich guy, Warren Buffett or something like that. And they'll say, God, you live next door to that guy. Oh, holy cow. Your property, which had been worth $800,000, I think it's now worth about $2 million. Uh, is he entitled to collect from me for the improvement? Oh, that's the market. No, no, we got to respect market values, but <clears throat> it goes the other way. We seem to think that there's an injury. And I would, I would confine the injury to whether or not there's a trespass. If there's not, you know, if, you know it, it's, it's like I, if I live next door to you and I, I move in next door and I'm in, known as an avowed communist or something like that, or may, maybe in, in, in this day and age, uh, someone has been convicted of child molestation. And now I go out and I finally find a house I can live in and I'm living there and you don't like it. Have I committed a trespass? I don't see it. Richard? That? Am I through? Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you much.